All right. Well, welcome, everyone. I think we can get started with this evening's program. Um, I want to thank everyone for attending Mohonk. Mohonk Preserves Virtual Programming. Um, this evening's topic is Stone Mysteries of the Shawangunk Mountains, and our presenter is Glenn Kreisberg. Um, my name is Lauren Bohr. I'm a, an education coordinator for public and youth programs here at Mohonk Preserve. I'm going to be monitoring and facilitating the presentation this evening. Um, before I introduce our presenter, um, I have just a few reminders for everyone attending the webinar. Um, please keep yourself muted. Um, that way there's no distractions or interruptions during the presentation. Um, and if you have any questions, feel free to use the chat. Um, that way you can type out your question. Um, it'll be right there. And at the end of the presentation, um, we will be able to answer questions. And maybe your question will even be answered during the program as well. But um, you might also forget it by the time it comes to the end. So, so when you have a question, um, enter it right there in the chat and we'll address it at the end of the program. Um, this presentation uh, is being recorded, so if for any reason you need to um, head out a little early and you're worried about missing some of it, it will be recorded and I'll be sending the link out. The link will also be available on our website for everyone. Um, so we have quite an archive of past programming, a lot by Bill Bakaitis, who has done um, many of our mushroom programs, several on history, um, and some on diversity as well as phenology and other science topics. Um, um, we will also be having, I was just uh, talking about this a little bit earlier, we will be having another webinar um, on Wednesday of next week. So next week is already December. Um, and so if you're interested, that webinar is called Playing in the Mud, How Earth Scientists Learn About Climate Change. Um, so it's going to be a really great presentation um, from one of the instructors at Vassar College, um, uh, Kirsten um, Menking. She'll be presenting that. So um, look for that, register for that, sign up for that one. It should be a really, really good one. Um, so like I said, um, we're going to get going with our day. So let me introduce our presenter. Presenter is Glenn Kreisberg. Um, Glenn is an author, a radio engineer, and outdoor guide in the Hudson Valley and Catskills Mountains of New York. Um, his books include Spirits in Stone, Mysteries of the Ancient Past, and Lost Knowledge of the Ancients. Glenn has served two terms as vice president of the New England Antiquities Research Association and studied ar archaeoastronomy at SUNY and archaeoacoustics in Malta. He's co-founder of the nonprofit Overlook Mountain Center in Woodstock, where he currently lives with his family. And I'm guessing that's where you're coming to, uh, to us <laughs> from this evening. So um, without further ado, here is Glenn presenting on the Stone Mysteries of the Schwangunk Mountain. So take it away, Glenn. Thanks a lot, Lauren. Um, thanks, Mohonk Preserve, for inviting me to talk tonight. I'm going to uh, go ahead and share my screen, and we'll get started. Well, I'm not seeing my screen to share, but stand by, we'll figure it out. Sorry for the delay, folks. I'm usually better at this and more prepared, but uh, we'll get it going. Technology uh, is something that I work with almost daily. I'm just flailing at it at the moment. Let's see. Um, I'm guessing everybody is still just seeing Lauren. Okay, stand by.
Let me know when we're good here and that everybody can see the opening slide. I have the opening slide on my screen, so I think we're all set. Perfect. Okay, should have done a dry run of that, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, so again, welcome everybody. I'm going to uh, forward through this and hopefully my controls will allow me to. And okay. So we're here tonight to talk about Stone Mysteries of the Shawangog Mountains. I'd like to start out um, by basically providing a fact about the amount of stonework in the Northeast. And as part of the 1880 US Census, there was something called a Stone Field Survey, um, where they basically counted the miles of stone walls and stone constructions in the Northeast. And they came up with a figure of 240,000 miles of stonework um, existing in the, in, the, in the Northeast in about 1880. And um, if you think about that, 240,000 miles of stonework, that's enough to reach to the moon or to wrap around the earth 10 times. That's a lot of stonework. And it's also a lot of stonework to have been constructed in the period of time, let's say 200 years from 1680 to 1880 when there would have been a, a uh, significant wall building population, let's say. And the question is, would there have been enough of a, world, of, of a wall building population in, in that period to have built that amount of, of stone? And it's kind of counterintuitive and counter logical to think that it was all built and that none of it was pre-existing. So we have to consider that some of it may be older than when the settlers first arrived and when Europeans first arrived. And we're looking at some sites that are both cultural and ceremonial. And there, there's a difference in that, um, you know, every, everything that's uh, cultural is not ceremonial. Uh, but of course, everything that is ceremonial is cultural. So um, we, want to, we want to keep that in mind and understand um, that when we go walking in the Northeast, and I'm sure everybody in this room has done a lot of walking in the woods, in our area, you come across unusual stone features, um, old foundations, stone walls, old roads, unusual boulders set up in particular ways. And it really is part of our, our uh, landscape and, and part, you know, part of uh, what we come across, but we don't always know what we're seeing. And some of it um, is obvious and some of it isn't. Um, and as Lauren mentioned, I served uh, two terms as the uh, Vice President of NERA, the New England Antiquities Research Association, which really looks into this stuff and tries to figure out what it is in its proper cultural context, because it's not always clear and the experts don't always agree. Um, I do like to refer to Doug Harris, who is the retired uh, Deputy Tribal Historic Preservation Officer for the Narragansett. He always says, let the landscape speak. And he was taught that by his elders. Um, it, it, I wanna just say, I, I am not an archeologist. I am not Native American, um, but I've worked with archeologists and I've worked with the Native American community, both federally and state recognized tribes. And they've shared some things with me that I'm, I'm happy to share tonight. And we're talking about archeoastronomy and landscape archeology. span It's not always clear what those terms are. So, Archaeoastronomy is simply the way ancient people used the sky, observed the sky, its movements, and incorporated what they saw and observed into their belief system and practices. And landscape archaeology um, is, is how ancient people used the landscape and used the features of the landscape, whether it's rivers or lakes or peninsulas or mountains, um, again, to, to create um, part of their beliefs and worldview. So, you know, if we think of a landscape as representing um, a, a living synthesis between humans, you know, people and the land that they inhabit, um, we can think of a skyscape as a landscape that contains a portion of the sky or horizon from which cultural stories can be constructed. So that's kind of what we're gonna be talking about. And it is important that we recognize and acknowledge um, that all the land we live on, uh, where our houses are, where we send our kids to school, where we you know, send our mail at the post office, shop for food, it's all on land 
that was once and is still ancestral lands to um, uh, you know, Native American people who in many cases were dispossessed uh, of those lands um, and, and ceded control uh, without their permission. So I think it's really important that we mention that, honor their heritage, protect and promote um, their culture. They would refer to a pile of stones like this as Manitou Asano, that's, uh, that's local Muncie. Uh, in Eastern Algonquin, like Narragansett, it might be Manitou Hasanash, but it basically means spirit stones. And, and this is an example of something we have in the Catskills, and some people interpret this as a, uh, as a turtle effigy. A lot of the work that I do is based on books that I've read and, and um, previous research by other folks. This is one of the more important books when it comes to cultural and ceremonial stone landscapes by James Maver and Byron Dix, came out in 1989. And um, it's really interesting is I, I, I bought a copy um, and these guys weren't lightweights. They were both near members through the uh, 60s and 70s. James Maver on the left there was the, um, worked at Woods Hole. He was a Naval architect, one, uh, one of the co-inventors of the Alvin submersible submarine. Um, and Byron Dix on the right there was an optics engineer who worked at NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory. Uh, so these guys were really kind of heavyweight researchers and they put their, their uh, skills to use. Um, and really Manitou made the case that Native Americans in the Northeast built in stone, aligned their constructions with events on the horizon. Um, and they were making the case because the case had to be made. It's not an accepted um, belief, certainly by archaeologists or historians that the natives did this, although it's starting to change. And we're going to talk a little bit about that. Uh, really interesting for a moment, I, I bought a book uh, probably 25 years ago by Ignatius Donnelly called The uh, Atlantis, the Antediluvian Civilization, kind of the, the original research book on, on Atlantis, which, you know, these days people kind of poo-poo that. But I bought that used book and I opened up the cover and it were, were newspaper clippings which is like finding gold. If you buy a used book and you open it up, there's newspaper clippings, it kind of blows your mind. Um, these were from the New York Times, 1967, and there's James Maver. I don't know if you can read that, but there he is down in the hole. And I, I think you can see my cursor, I'm hoping. Um, leading the excavations at Saturini in the Mediterranean after um, in, in the late 60s, after it was discovered that there may be a tie to Atlantis in the destruction uh, by volcanoes and by the um, configuration of the islands. So this was, uh, I think this was the weekday, Wednesday issue, and then it actually made the science, uh, the Sunday science edition. Um, so it's, you know, this teaches us that we want to keep an open mind and that science can look at ancient mysteries that are not solved in a serious way. And um, I don't know if anybody on this presentation happened to see about a year ago, um, a gentleman named Graham Hancock had a series on Netflix called Ancient Apocalypse, which was quite popular, but it took a lot of heat because it, it, it proposed that there was an ancient civilization that was destroyed at the end of the last ice age that, you know, was more advanced than we give it credit for. Basically that there was something missing from the human uh, record and perhaps there's more to be learned. And he took a lot of heat for it um, from the archaeological community, but I always like to remind people to keep an open mind and this helps that. Now, of course, we know archaeoastronomy has been practiced across the world um, by many different cultures. I'm going to show some examples. We, of course, have Stonehenge in the upper left. Uh, the upper right is uh, Mandachar, the um, temple on the Isle of Malta, which is the oldest still operating solar calendar on Earth, um, about uh, um, 5,000 uh, 5, BC, 5200 BC. And the bottom left is a site in Peru called Chiquillo, which is a solar calendar that shows uh, where the sun is on the horizon at different times of the year um, from a particular viewing point. And on the right is actually a chamber in Putnam County, a megalithic chamber. There are hundreds of them. Um, and many of them are oriented to the equinox with the winter solstice sunrise so that the sun, sun, uh, sun shines directly in the entrance uh, on that um, shortest day of the year, marking when it starts to get longer again. So that's many of the reasons why they built these sites were calendars. Um, and this just talks about archaeoastronomy and some of the different 
sites around the world and some of the different angles and bearings that we want to keep in mind. And we'll, we'll look a little bit more into that. Um, you know, archaeoastronomy is also known as observational astronomy, and it's been practiced by humans since prehistoric times when we first looked up at the night sky and wondered. So uh, carried out by ancient populations from all parts of the world, it's the basis for countless cultural myths about the movements and the heavens and um, its inhabitants. Here's a closer look at the chamber in Putnam County, just across the river from, from uh, Ulster and, and um, Orange. Um, you find hundreds of these stone chambers oriented towards the winter solstice sunrise. And there was a wonderful researcher named Enrique Nguro, who I always like to mention because for years he led people to these chambers uh, on tours uh, on the solstice morning and would use his, uh, his Super 8 film camera to, to film the solstice sunrise. So uh, he was a wonderful gentleman. So cultures, uh, including Native American cultures in the West, and this is a, a book by a gentleman named Gary David, who wrote around about the Orion Zone. He showed how the Anastasi, the ancestral Hopi, um, migrated along these pathways. They built, their, so the archeological sites are right on the bearings that line up with um, where the sun would rise and set on the shortest and longest days of the year. So it's a, a cultural practice that we see, um, you know, in many different areas, many, many different traditions. This is actually our capital. Um, and David Overson wrote a very interesting book called The Secret Architecture of Our Nation's Capital, uh, which we know was built on a Masonic tradition. Many of our founding fathers were, were Freemasons and belonged to, to that society. And it turns out that many of the avenues and boulevards and, and monuments in Washington are very much oriented to the sky and to the horizon and to sunrises and sunsets. And also some happen to be aligned with, um, with uh, star and, and planet rises um, and sunsets. John Michel in his book, The New View Over Atlantis, showed how many sites in Great Britain, many of the ancient sites, uh, many which were co-opted by Christian churches and built on sites of earlier pagan spiritual sites were again aligned on certain bearings that um, had astronomical significance. So I, I, you know, I like to point these things out. Um, but what we really wanna consider is what the Native Americans had to say in this resolution that was passed in 2007, which read in, in part, with, within the ancestral territories of Uset tribes, there exist sacred ceremonial stone landscapes and their stone structures, which are of particular cultural value to certain member tribes. For thousands of years before immigration of Europeans, the medicine people of Uset tribal ancestors used these sacred landscapes to sustain people's reliance on mother nature, spirit energies of balance and harmony. Whether these stone structures are massive or small structures, stacked boulders, stone rows or effigies, these prayers in stone often are mistaken by archeologists and state historic preservation officers as the efforts of farming, uh, clearing stones, agricultural and wall building purposes. So, you know, here we have a statement and a resolution from United Tribes saying that there are important cultural resources that are not necessarily recognized for what they are by the established um, uh, regulators, let's say. And this is, and in a sense, this is why, because this is what's in the textbooks that's being taught um, to the students. And, and uh, you know, I've read this book and I'm very familiar with Herbert Kraft. And it's you know well over 20 years old, but it states, or he states, there's absolutely no proof that man-made megaliths or dolmen with or without grave objects or any other manifestations of old world funerary construction or astronomical alignments exist in Lenape lands or in the Northeast. The burden of proof is on those who make such claims. And thus far, every claim has been unsupported by satisfactory scientific evidence. And um, I can assure you that Joe Diamond at SUNY New Paltz Wholly agrees with this and would not um, recognize that Native Americans built in stone in the Northeast or had anything to do with uh, archaeoastronomy. Um, but I'm here to say I don't actually believe that. And there's actually quite a few other people who do not subscribe to that kind of outdated dog dogma. Um, this was a conference head held almost 10 years ago now up at Colgate University, hosted by Anthony Avini. Um, Tony Avini is probably considered America's premier archaeoastronomer, but he's done all his work in Mexico and southern uh, uh, Meso and, and Central America. 
And he had no idea there was anything like this in our region until Lori Rush, who's the cultural resource manager for Fort Drum up in the Adirondacks. She's an archaeologist. And they came to her and said, uh, you know, we're, they were doing a, a perimeter fence project and they came across unusual stone objects they thought she should know about. And when she investigated them by reaching out to groups like NERA and to tribal historic preservation offices, um, they came and investigated and said, this is in fact a ceremonial landscape. And they made accommodations um, and, and mitigated the impact to allow them to remain. So, um, you know, when Anthony Avini at Colgate heard about this from Lori, he said, we should hold a symposium because this is kind of groundbreaking news. And um, what was really groundbreaking and why it was a watershed moment is you had three different groups of people there. You had not only the academics and the state regulators from, you know, the uh, National Forest Service, the National Park Service, Department of Agriculture, Department of Interior, state regulators from, you know, New York State Department of uh, Parks, Recreation and Historic Preservation. And you had Native Americans all there up at Colgate, um, not only Native Americans from the uh, tribal preservation offices, but also elders from tribes all over the Northeast, including the Haudenosaunee, Iroquois, um, St. Regis Mohawk, the Narragansett, um, and other tribes that came down from Ontario. And it was held at the Kung Ho Visualization Center, which is a beautiful um, high-tech planetarium where they were able to recreate the stories on the, on the, on the ceiling, on the dome, for everybody to, uh, to see and, and analyze. And basically the takeaway was the federal and state regulators had to admit that none of this was on their radar. And they really had no sensitivity to these types of cultural resources of significance. Um, so I, I, I like to point that out. And we're gonna start turning to, um, to our region and, and my research. And what I do is take a GIS approach and I make a database listing all the sites and their locations and um, their features so that you can sort and filter these sites um, and look for patterns. Uh, you can look for concentrations, you can look for distribution. You can really begin to understand how they are laid out on the landscape. Um, and this is actually a, uh, a map of, of what's in our region. Um, it doesn't include the chambers. If, if, there, if there was uh, all the chambers, there'd be a big cluster over here. I do have those mapped as well, but we're not focusing on those. We've got the Catskill Mountains up here. We've got the Shawanglings down here. And one of the patterns I noticed when looking at these sites is a trend line in both directions. And I'm going to um, highlight it here. As you see, many of the sites connect to each other along a particular bearing. These are actually what we see down here is uh, up near Bonacue, um, you know, parallel. These, these are sites in the Catskills. Um, some of them have line of sight, some of them don't. This is a line known as the Hammond Acid Line. It comes from the point of Long Island, Fort Pond and Montauk, and goes up to Devil's Tombstone and, and much further uh, in the Catskills uh, and all along the same bearing. And it's not just um, southeast to northwest, which is a winter solstice to sunrise, summer solstice to sunset. You have the reciprocal, which is uh, northeast to southwest, which is the uh, summer solstice to sunrise and winter solstice to sunset. So you can see how this marks, um, it's almost like a, a pattern on the landscape. What we have here is a chart from Professor Curtis Hoffman, who has a book called Stone Prayers that came out. Um, very, very analytical book, uh, very scientific. He's an archeologist from uh, uh, UMass. Um, and this is just showing what he shows as the calculations to where you would expect to see the azimuths uh, to the, um, horizon where you would expect to see summer solstice sunrises, winter solstice sunset, um, and the equinoxes, which are always due east and west. And of course you have to, this is true, so you have to account for um, magnetic deviation from true, between true and magnetic north, which for our region is about 14, between uh, 14 and 14 and a half degrees, but it's always changing because magnetic north is always changing. Um, and I'm giving you kind of a crash course here on, on archaeoastronomy and the important the important azimuths and bearings that that are used. Uh, of course, we know that it's not just the sun that ancient people observed, but the moon as well. And the moon has a different cycle, which is uh, much longer than the sun. 
where the sun moves from its furthest north to furthest south point in the year, the, uh, the um, lunar minimum and the lunar maximum is an 18.6 year cycle that varies um, within seven degrees of where the solstices are as shown here. Um, and this is just kind of putting it into a three dimensional context. So you can visualize from a viewing point looking out in a particular direction where monuments might be built towards where the sun or an event on the horizon is occurring. Um, and this is a chart I compiled from a bunch of different researchers showing that there's a lot of different alignments, not just the equinoxes and sunsets and not just the lunar minimums and maximum, but in native tradition and, and um, spirituality, they have entrances and exits to the underworld and the sky world because they very much had a three-dimensional worldview as many ancient cultures around the world did, you know, the saying as above, so below. So, um, you know, they had an underworld that was inhabited by supernatural beings. They had a sky world and they had ways to get to it through, through passageways that had, were particular alignments on the horizon and they were reciprocal. So you wouldn't, you know, an entrance wasn't an exit and as exit wasn't an entrance. You hear, you see the entrance to the underworld, the reciprocal is the exit to the sky world. Um, so it's, you know, it's very, very interesting concept. We don't really have that kind of three-dimensional worldview any longer, but it was essential um, to, the, to the views of ancient people. So now we're going to start focusing on some of the things that we find in the Shuangoks, um, one of my favorite places to be. And from Evan Pritchard, local uh, historian and Native American uh, scholar, um, Shuangong means a uh, place of smoke uh, on the mountain. Gunk is mountain, and Shawan is referring to, to uh, where smoke is seen. And according to Evan, um, that has something to do with perhaps a um, Indian fort that was well known, a Lenape fort that was built on the base of the cliffs that was burned during the uh, Indian Wars, the Asopus Indian Wars. And it may have been a reference to the smoke from that, from that uh, burning fort, but also and I suggested this to Evan and he didn't dispute it, the ridge is known for fire, forest fires. I mean, Minnewaska burns, uh, you know, Mohonk does prescribe burns. It's a place where fire does occur. And it may be that these things happened um, both naturally and, and man-made in the past, uh, managed by uh, ancient people um, or natural as we still have happening today. Um, The Shuangungs, and I'm sure many here know this, are the last few miles of the Appalachian mountain range, very separate geologic feature from the Catskill Mountains. Uh, the, in the last glacier maximum, you did have glaciation and the Shuangungs covered with ice. Uh, the Catskills were not, so you do not find the same kind of glacier polish and scoring on the top of the uh, Catskills that you find on the top of the Shuangunks. Uh, you do find sea life fossils on the top of the Catskills because it was once the floor of an ocean uh, going back hundreds of millions of years, but that's an entirely different story. Um, of course, you can't mention Mohawk without showing the beautiful resort, which is world renowned for its beauty and location. And of course, it's also very well, well known as the Gunks um, for climbers. Shanggong is another name that's quite old. Um, I'm an old rock climber. I still get out and climb. That's me on the left on high exposure back in the day, as they say, and an uncredited uh, un, uh, un, um, climber on the right on, on the CCK, uh, both considered moderate climbs, so they look kind of extreme there. So we're gonna zoom in on the, on the uh, Shuangang Ridge here and look at a number of sites that are kind of dotted along it. I like to, what, what kind of clued me into there being sites on the ridge top of the Gunks uh, in the Shuangok Mountains is this book by Salvador Trento. Came out, um, I don't know, probably 40 years ago now, late 70s, I want to say, 78. And he was an Oxford trained archaeologist who had a research center in Middletown, New York, and spent his time researching things in the region. And when I read his book and heard there were things up on the top of the ridges, I started heading out to look for them. So we're going to look at seven sites in the Gunks, um, moving from uh, south to north. This is just a list of them. And here they are kind of plotted on the map. I'm going to start with what are known as the Millbrook Mountain Boulders um, up on the summit. And we'll head north and, and look at these other sites. 
This is just kind of pointing out the location of it. And you have large boulder placements and standing stones and perched boulder that are found located along the Summit Ridge Trail. And again, if you probably, if you've hiked the Gugs, you may have walked by these and not really noticed them, or maybe you have and noticed and wondered what they were. Um, so of course our magnificent Millbrook Mountain and these uh, are found on the uh, Northern end of it. And as you walk through the woods, you come across this row of boulders. Now, most geologists would tell you that these fell out of the glacier where they where they are seen as the glacier melted, the stones were in it, and they just kind of fell out. Um, this is looking down the row from this lichenated stone, which is the furthest east one. And you can see how some of them appear to be propped. And again, a geologist would say that's how it came to rest out of the glacier. And I'm not saying that's not possible, but I'm also saying it is possible that in the 10 or 12,000 years since the end of the last ice age, uh, people who were certainly around could have come around and, and manipulated these things. So I've got the compass there. I'm looking down the, the, the row of boulders. And we can see it's about 300 and uh, just a little over 300 degrees. You'd expect on the compass for it to be about 318, and it's pretty close to that. And just before you get to it, hiking from north to south, you find these two stones that are right on the path. If you were to turn around from these, you would see that row of boulders. And this I call a peg stone because it's, it looks like it's got a peg leg and that somehow it was propped up in that way. Now, if this was along the carriage roads, we would assume that when the construction was done by the steam shovels back in the early part of the 20th century and late part of the 19th century, they may have manipulated things using their steam uh, uh, power. But this is on the top of Millbrook, so no steam shovels were ever up here. So this is either natural or manipulated by, by humans. And here's this uh, standing stone. So now we're gonna go a little further north and uh, as you hike down behind a bayer, there's a trail that takes you down the um, carriage road there. I'm forgetting if it's old Minnewaska Road or Minnewaska Road. Um, Traps Road, perhaps. Uh, but as you get down there, you start seeing these millstones, obvious millstones um, from the uh, uh, 18th century, uh, 19th century, maybe 18th century. Um, and many, 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 you know, maybe some of you have hiked down there and have seen this, but this is obviously a millstone construction and harvest site. Um, you can see that the sides are not as heavily lichenated as the top because they've been cut away. And there's actually some opportunities to do study of lichen growth and determine how long uh, it, the colonies have been growing in particular regions. There has been no study of lichenology growth in our region. These are pictures from Alaska and Norway, colder climates where lichens grow much slower than, than our region but they're still able to determine from the growth of the colony, um, the age uh, uh, in, in number of years based on the diameter in millimeters. So um, potentially you could, you know, on the edge here, do measurements, compare them to the measurements on top, on the measurement, you know, in here and kind of come up with a, 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 a range of dates when this may have been cut. Um, and there, there's other research, uh, tech methodologies that could potentially shine more light on that as well. But this isn't so much a mystery. We know what this is. Here's a failed one. Somebody probably got three quarters of the way around and hit it and it cracked in half and they moved on to the next one. So they abandoned it. Um, these may have also been training areas where they took young stone millstone masons to try to see how they would fare in cutting their own and some may have failed, but these are all attempts. Um, we're going to move now a little further north, north to what I call the Upper Peterskill Domain and Slab, and this is on a summit, um, uh, a saddle summit ridge up in the High Peterskill. And I was walking through this saddle. Uh, there's a trail that goes through here. You know, you're just above Lost City, um, and I looked up to my left towards the summit, and you know, from the trail, and I saw light coming from underneath a stone. So I hiked up there a little bit off trail, they saw this interesting boulder, which uh, to me appears to be propped up. It's got 360 degrees, it's a, a view, it's on a ridge top, very prominent, um, off trail though. Um, 
And when I put the compass on it, it's got these interesting holes in it, which I don't know what that's about, if it's natural erosion or if it's something that was chipped to help move the stone using levers. Uh, it's not that big a stone that, uh, you know, a couple of big burly men could probably uh, move it around. Um, but when I put the compass on it, I saw that this construction has some very particular points. So it was in some ways acting like a compass um, in that it has a north point, very prominent. It's got a south point. It's got a west point, all built into the configuration of the stone, which is propped up with, um, you know, a sh shims to hold it in place. I, I refer to this as a, a shim stone. And again, geologists might say this is all naturally occurring. I can't argue with them. This is just highlighting those uh, those particular holes. So, you know, if it was um, dropped by the glacier, it, it's quite a coincidence that it has these um, these points the way it does that make it a compass stone. Not too far from that on that summit is a, uh, a big slab that, you know, people um, fantasize that maybe this was stood up at one time. And... Um, you can examine it and you can see there are no cut marks. Nobody, nobody chiseled this or broke it or drilled it. Um, so people speculate maybe it was standing at one time and fell over and broke into these pieces. But I think I would agree with any geologist who would say that what you see here is classic exfoliation. This is at the very top of the mountain. The mountain is pushing up slowly and it's exfoliating the conglomerate um, and, and creating these, um, these breaks and this large slab that's been sectioned. But it's fun to speculate. Um, it would be a huge model if it was, if it was ever stood upright, uh, but you could never really in, in any way prove that that was the case. Now, just across that saddle, um, you may have seen in the other map, uh, we have what I call the Lost City Quarry. It's at the very summit of the Dickey Bar Preserve. Um, I hiked up there one day exploring off trail and I came across this missing piece of quartzite conglomerate bed bedrock. Basically, they took out the whole corner from this slab. Um, and I say they, I don't know who they are. I would speculate this pitch pine is probably at least 100, maybe 150 years old. It's a pretty healthy one. So it started growing after they quarried. And you can see they, they shaped and, and cut the stones down. These are too thick to be millstones. Um, in my eye, this was a... Um, you know, you had, and here you can see some drill stones. I always think maybe you had a couple of very industrious young men from the Rondout Valley, got the idea, let's go up and quarry some stone. And they made their way up with a cart. I could not find any road or trail leading to the site. And they quarried this stone and took it away with them, um, cut it down into manageable pieces and brought it down into the valley and sold it to help feed their family. Um, but it's quite something and quite um, industrious and uh, obviously a, a cultural um, resource of significance. And I did uh, lead a group up there for the Adirondack Mountain Club last winter. We took a winter hike up there, beautiful views when the leaves are off and um, introduced this site to those folks who uh, you know, thought it was quite interesting. And then hiking down that day, we came across this stone throne in the woods on the slabs behind, uh, leading back down to the uh, to the trail between the saddle. So, um, you know, who's who used this and what this was for? Who knows? But somebody was up there and made this stone seat. Uh, so now we're going to jump forward to beautiful sky top and what I call the Lily Pond Stone. Um, behind a smiley tower, hundred years old, just celebrated. Um, you have Lily Pond. Again, I'm assuming many people on this um, presentation are familiar with Lily Pond, uh, man-made. Um, and but just beyond it is this boulder that's also set up in a particular way. And somebody sent me this picture, uh, familiar with what I do and research. And they said, what do you make of this? They said, it looks very similar to another boulder a few miles north. And I wonder if it had any alignments so I was up there on summer solstice in 2017 as the sun was setting and this shaft of light projected onto the base of the stone. 
I was like, wow, that's pretty wild. I wonder if it comes through the other side. And sure enough, that, that you know, shaft of light projects a perfect triangle, equilateral triangle on the base stone below it. If you go back a couple, you see there's a, a, a black area here and you see a triangle and that's the phenomenon. Uh, my friend who was there, Jim Munson said, oh, it looks like a glow hole, um, which is a fair description. Uh, and it only happens on the summer solstice at sunset is a close-up of it and this is an app that you can show where the bearing is and you can see it's a little over 300 degrees um which again would would indicate a summer solstice uh, a winter solstice sunrise summer solstice sunset so what we were seeing here is a summer solstice sunset light phenomenon on this stone on the summit of sky pop which is quite fascinating um and just to back up you know who would have built something like this? Say this is very ancient. Um, I, I, you know, I, I think it's interesting to contemplate and speculate that some have suggested that the the uh, golden triangle here, this triangle, might represent um, a Tanit symbol, which is a symbol of the sacred feminine um, or or the goddess culture. Um, but we also have an element of sun worship here in the solstice uh, alignment of the sun phenomenon. So, you know, I always speculate when were the first people in our region uh, arriving. And, you know, it's at the after the end of the last ice age. Some people say there's evidence they were here before the end of the last ice age, but they would have come, I believe, from the East and would have been a maritime culture. And they may have brought with them um, beliefs that had already been well-established for many, many years. Um, beliefs such as goddess worship, uh, fertility worship, uh, sun worship, which were in some ways the oldest religions on earth. So. Uh, you know, this is representing something or it's completely coincidental, but if it is uh, purposeful, I think it's representing something important uh, to the mind in the minds of the people who, who built it. Um, I've also heard people say it's too big a stone to set up, um, but I don't necessarily believe that. We're going to move to um, Bonacu Crag here and what I call the Bonacu Crag Summit Solstice Sunrise Stone. It's a lot of S's there. I'm sure many people on this presentation are familiar with the summit of uh, Bonacu Crag. And I was up there with my buddy, G uh, Ian Jacobus, one of my old climbing buddies, and he was eating there having lunch and I was standing on the summit stone. So this is, this he's on the summit stone here. From this stone on the top of Bonacu, everything drops away. That is the highest point of Bonacu. Um, and this stone is right next to it. And it's obviously been shifted in its position in the bedrock. And anybody can go up there and see this. Um, you can actually see where this line and corner was once aligned with this line. And somebody shifted the point out from where it was parallel on the bedrock. I don't know if it was cut or split or if it was naturally fractured, but somebody shifted it. And you can see how they shifted it here. And you can see the, the um, it's really fascinating. Again, the lichen studies, you can see how the, the top of Bonacue is just covered with colony upon colony upon colony, ancient colonies of lichen growth that are quite massive and cover the whole top. But where things have been moved, it, you can see different patterns. Um, so this guy is now pointing, you know, here's where it was. And now it's pointing to the northeast. And I was up there, I've been going up there on sunrises on the uh, summer solstice, and I did capture this picture pointing to where the, the new orientation of that sun is aligned with where the sun comes over the horizon on the longest day of the year. So again, this is to me pretty strong evidence. And you know, the, the um, and here here is just showing, it's not exactly on the horizon because the degree should be about 57, but it's already well above the horizon. But um, you know, perhaps the, it, it was at one time clear cut. So it'd be a clear view right down to the, to the very horizon. Um, and remember, the sky starts right at our feet. It doesn't start above our head, but it actually starts uh, uh, just above the ground. Um, so, you know, were the people who came here and moved this stone sun worshipers? Was it done in, in antiquity? Was it done, you know, by hippies in the 60s? I can't really tell you. But there is some new technology that I'm going to talk about in a moment uh, that may help shed some light. 
Uh, and that is what's called optically stimulated luminescence or OSL dating, which can take sediments from be below a wall or a boulder and determine in the lab when sunlight last shone on the feldspar and mica and quartz crystals that are in, uh, in the sediments. So it's, uh, it's a fairly new technology that's being corroborated with other technologies such as carbon-14. These dates have been matching up where they have sites that have been tested both with OSL and uh, C-14, they correlate. So the, um, the methodology of optical stimulated luminescence is getting more and more uh, relied on and, and um, accepted as a way of dating stone features, constructed stone features, which up until now, there's been no way to really date unless there were artifacts that were found in association with them. And uh, in conjunction with NERA, um, and this was, this was published uh, about a year ago, um, Dr. James Feathers and Maureen Florin. Feathers is from University of Washington. Maureen Florin is from Stony Brook. And they came up to our region and collected samples that they analyzed in the lab at U Washington. And um, Dr. Feathers was in Lewis Hollow in Woodstock and took two samples of stone constructions there. And uh, what they found, they, they sampled uh, sites throughout New England, throughout Massachusetts, Pennsylvania, uh, several dozen sites. And they found ranges of stone construction from 2500 BC, about 5,000 years ago, uh, 4,500 years ago, uh, right up through contact um, in, our, in our era. So um, they're, they're, you know, it's helping to build the case um, through the scientific method. And, and you know, for the scientific method, basically you need to be able to um, test something, validate the test and repeat the test. And you can go up to, um, to this stone uh, on the summit and test it. Does it align? Yes, it aligns. Uh, is it aligned with the bearings we know to be consistent with a, a solstice sunrise? Yes. And can you repeat that? And the answer is yes. So to me, this is pretty strong evidence. Um, so the next stone up uh, about a mile north of the summit of Monocue, you come to what I call the North Schwangung Dolmen. Um, it's also a stone that is a compass stone in that it has the cardinal directions uh, in its orientation. And this is a very odd angle. Again, for, for this to just drop out of the glacier and rest on is three base stones. Uh, to me is highly unlikely. Um, and when you put the compass on this as well, you see uh, very prominent points. Um, and you see again, the shim stones and the support stones. Here's the south point or the south nose, the north nose. It's the north nose again. The west, I think the west is more of a face but it does have a nose. This is this is the west side. You can see a kind of a nose there. So it's not only a compass stone, but it's potentially a calendar stone, uh, in that it, it has a uh, on, uh, you know it has a light phenomenon that happens on the winter solstice. And here you see on December twentieth how you can see my uh, I was there. You see, I actually have a helmet on, I believe, or a hat. But you can see my head there in the shadow. Um, and you can see how I, I did a diagram showing how the axis of the stone is very much got a north and south uh, aspect to it. And when you look up to the northwest from this stone, you, you have a view of the Catskills there in the distance, and that's actually Picamus back here um, to the northwest. Here's the North Shuangong Dolmen. And it turns out that this stone on Picamus Mountain called Reconnoiter Rock, which is on the DEC hiking maps, um, also is a calendar stone and a compass stone. And it has very prominent points that are oriented to the cardinal directions. Um, this one had a nice sun shade line on it that allow you to see exactly where north lined up. And these two, I believe, have a relationship. They're about 18 miles apart. I did run what's called a path profile to determine whether or not there's line of sight. So there is, there's nothing obstructing the view. This is the Reconnoiter Rock position. This is the Shuangong Dolmen position. And there's nothing in between to prevent, say, a signal fire 
um, built on a certain date from being seen from one side or the other just before sunrise or just after sunset on important days of the year. So I think it's possible this is evidence a group or a culture either passed through or inhabited this region and used the landscape to establish and create and preserve astronomic alignments and calendar sites based on observations of the sky. Um, and this is just using software that shows it's 318 degrees magnetic, 317.6, which is exactly what the bearing is that you would expect a uh, winter solstice sunrise, summer solstice sunset to be. So that's showing that alignment between the North Shwanga Dolmen and Peak Moose Mountain, Peak Moose Rock, or Reconnoiter Rock. This is the North, uh, this is the Bontecue Summit Stone, and it happens to align with another site, not line of sight. There is a mountain between them, but it does align with a site in Frost Valley uh, known for several uh, inscribed petroglyphs. Uh, I think this is might be the last site we're going to look at. It's not in the Gunks, but it's near the Gunks. It's on a mountain called uh, Marlboro Mountain in the town of Platakil. Um, and from this site, you have a beautiful view of the Gunks 15 miles to the northeast and beyond them. The Catskills, another 15 miles beyond. Uh, I don't have that photo. I meant to try to get it in here. But this is a turtle effigy site that's really amazing. Uh, large rock shelter that seems to be configured like a, a turtle. And when the sun sets on the equinox, you get a light phenomenon right behind the head of the turtle in this little grotto. It captures the sunlight at sunset, which I think is very purposeful. And then you have another phenomenon that happens with cast shadow on the, um, this is on the solstice uh, at noon time. And what you see here is this 90 degree orthogonal shadow that moves closer to that grotto where the sun is gonna show up on the uh, uh, sunset uh, and be captured. So again, there is, um, a phenomenon known as shadow and cast light, or light and cast shadow, I should say, which is um, something that's difficult to discern, but is something that native populations and actually ancient populations around the world did employ in their construction, um, using shadows to point things out. So uh, really a spectacular sight up there. Um, we are wrapping up here. I just want to use a, um, give a research warning about AI. Because, of course, when AI came out, one of the first thing people did was try to find citations and um, research papers that would support uh, this type of research and found these wonderful stories. Um, <laughs> I call them stories. They turn out none of them are true. They, they are real journals. They are real institutions. And they are real researchers' names. But these papers were never writ written. Ge geometry of Landscape, a, a reconstruction astronomy site at Early Bays Complex in southeastern New England. No such paper. Sunrise and Sunset Observations of Northern Iroquois, Ethnohistory, which is a journal, and it cites it, but this is all a hallucination of AI. Um, uh, unfortunately, I should say, because it would be nice if these things were real to support, to support this type of research. Um, and again, I, I queried what academic papers discuss indigenous astronomy, mound building in Northeastern US, and I came up with some wonderful examples. But again, um, there is a William Gold uh, Gottenlinger, uh, but he never wrote this paper and none of these are real. So don't trust AI, uh, it's gonna mislead you, um, but do trust technology because there's a wonderful group of folks and you can find them on, on YouTube and watch a really great video um, called the, the Triad of Digital Technologies, um, and uh, Eva Gerbic, um, Tom Elmore, and Dave Gutowski employ three different technologies to analyze sites, record and analyze sites. Tom Elmore uses handheld LIDAR gathering. Um, Eva imports his file into GIS software and geolocates everything precisely. And then Dave Gutowski uses archaeoastronomy software like Stellarium to understand how the site fits into the sky and horizon and can go back and forward in time. So these guys have really been applying this type of technology to the kind of research to, that we're all trying to do to make the case that there are um, you know, significant resources, cultural resources, and information and secrets that can be
discern by analyzing these sites in a proper way so that they get credited in the uh, proper cultural context. Um, just want to make and mention Overlook Mountain Center, the nonprofit that I chair up in Woodstock. We do hikes throughout the year to many different sites. And you can find us at uh, overlookmountain.org. Um, we were responsible for sponsoring this sign on the Ashokan Rail Trail that got built a few years ago because they put 10 signs up on the trail and neglected to put a sign for the native population. So we, we uh, corrected that wrong. I also want to mention NERA, wonderful organization. They just had a conference a few weeks ago. They have two conferences a year. The one coming up in the spring will be up in Vermont and it will actually coincide with the total eclipse and they moved it into an area of Vermont that's in the path of totalitarian. So you will see the entire eclipse um, and you can get more information at uh, nera.org. And of course my publisher would be upset if I didn't mention my books. So this is available um, uh, in good bookstores. You can order it locally or get it online. And the books from the past, which are essays from other researchers, including myself from around the world, looking at the evolution of human consciousness civilization and technology, all tied to the stars and the movement. Um, and with that, I wanna thank you and, and take any questions we might have. I have no idea how we did on time. So I'm gonna stop sharing and we'll see what's in the, uh, the chat. Yeah, we, we did great on time. It is eight o'clock. Oh, yeah, look at that, exactly, exactly eight o'clock, wow. Exactly eight o'clock. So we do have some time for some questions. Um, in the chat, Let's see, um, uh, would you be where, willing to share your alignments chart? Uh, the alignment chart, uh, yes. Um, are you, I can send it to you if you're gonna be sending out an email. Yeah, yeah. Um, to folks, I can provide you yeah. with some material and you can, um, let me just see if I can get my screen to pop big again, but maybe not. Um, I will happy to share happy to share that chart. And again, you can get these books like Manitou and you know many of the, of the uh, ceremonial stone landscape researchers have dog-eared copies of that book that they're walking around the woods with, kind of compare things to. Um, but yes, I, I can provide that, and uh, Lauren can pass that along. Yeah, that'd be great. And then another I don't, I don't question. What, oh, I, I just don't know what you're seeing. I don't want you to like. Are, are, are you guys still seeing my screen, or did I yes. stop sharing? Yes, which? <laughs> uh, yes, we are still seeing your screen. Oh, okay, huh. I want to stop sharing. There we go. Hey. Just have to hit where it says stop sharing. There we go. Okay. <laughs> Easy okay. enough. Um, there's also a question about a link to the um, article by Dr. Feathers. Uh, yes, I can provide that, but it's no longer. Um, the. Uh, I can email that, a PDF of that, because you can't get it online unless you subscribe to the journal. Uh, when it was published, they made it available for 60 days for people to download for free. And then after that, you got to pay. But I will send you that as well. Okay, that would be great. Um, and just the, the other question that I see here is um, if this recording will be available. Yes, um, it will be. So um, this has been recorded. Um, it will be on our website. I will send the link to everyone who has registered because I know not everyone who registered was able to attend this evening or they came in late. Um, so along with um, the article by Dr. Feathers and then the alignment charts, I will send that to everyone who has registered as well, make that stuff available for everyone. Um, that's, that's easy enough to do. Um, all right, here's another question. How do you respond to the argument that a, that a long miles of 318 degree trajectory that laws of averages would find rocks in a specific alignment? Um, well, that would that would tell us that all of this that I just showed could potentially just be amazing coincidence. Um, and and you know, I, I do get um, I don't want to say accused, but I, I you know, um, you know, there's this concept that people like to throw around called pseudoscience. Uh, and um, you know, I, I, I try to avoid that because it, there are certain aspects of that, such as cherry picking. And yes, if you identify everything on the landscape and then you look for things to make patterns out of, um, you are able you are able to do that. Um, but when you when the pattern is consistent and repeated and you see it in many different areas, 
um, then there's something more going on. And uh, in the case of the solstice alignments with the boulders and, and the site locations, um, you know, we see this pattern throughout the United States. We see it throughout Central and South America. It's accepted pretty much worldwide. It's just not accepted in the Northeast for uh, various reasons, um, things that I call uh, convenient untruths, because if every one of these types of constructions was considered to be an ancient or a significant cultural feature or basically a Native American church, um, that would put a big damper on people coming in and just wanting to take the land for themselves and develop it in ways that is not regulated. So um, it's important that where cultural resources can be identified um, and, and shown to be significant, uh, that they're recognized. And I think some of these, maybe not all of them, but some of them deserve closer looks and, um, and perhaps a, you know, a, a determination can be made one way or the other, uh, who, you know, who, who, who the origin is. All right. Um, another question that we I have that here. I, th I think that was that's a pretty good answer. Um, how about the balanced rock east of Mud Pond? Are you familiar with that one? No, I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> so send me a picture, um, and I'll, I'll, I'll uh, Lauren can provide my email too if anybody wants to share things with me. And that's how a lot of this stuff gets discovered: is people send me emails, they send me pictures. We just identify an amazing site in Bly, uh, Bly Atwood. Um, that appears to potentially be the constellation Orion constructed on the ground. And up in Lewis Hollow in Woodstock, we have what might be the constellation Draco constructed on the ground. And Evan Pritchard, um, who I mentioned earlier, has also identified what he believes are constellations uh, of the Northern Hemisphere that have been constructed in stone on the ground. So we can provide some of that as well. Yeah, I'm sure that um, much like the balanced rock east of Mud Pond there, I'm sure people maybe have a few other ideas in their head of, of places locally that maybe they have some questions about a rock that just doesn't seem like it could possibly have fallen, as you said, fallen from glacier activity and eroded away in that particular position. So there might be a few more um, out there. And certainly there there, there was a ton of, of uh, European and and colonial stonework and people working in stone and you know making their mark on the land and leaving a cultural footprint but in many cases that footprint may be on top of a much older much more persistent footprint of people who were here for 10,000 years living you know masterfully off the land so um you know in some cases it may never be known but in some cases you can tell and you can also do the research you can go into the real property tax office in the county and start looking at parcel descriptions and deed descriptions going back to the very earliest handwritten ones and see references to ancient stone monuments. Um, mm. So I think that that's also uh, helps build the case. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, it's not just um, getting out there and finding these rocks, but it's also looking at the, the history of the land and how it was used as well to kind of determine whether or not it could in fact be um, something like um something marking the solstice yep well if anyone has any other questions we still have uh time before we have to wrap up but otherwise i want to thank everybody for listening to what i had to say and giving me feedback and um yeah, i always find it interesting and valuable to share this information with other people because i get feedback that just helps better understand what it is we're looking at yeah. No, no, this was this was a great presentation. Um, and uh, as I mentioned, this is being recorded. So I will send that out to everybody along with your email address in case questions pop into pe people's heads a little bit later. Um, and they have some inquiries that they want they want to ask you about. So I will be sure to share all that with everyone. All right. Well, um, wish everybody a very happy holiday season mm -hmm. Get out there. Hike around play in the snow, visit the preserve. Exactly. And, uh, you know, su support them because they're a great, great organization. I should mention, I, I worked as a, um, uh, as a ranger at the Mohonk Preserve back in the Tom Scheuer days, uh, and then was a guide for 10 years with Mountain Skills uh, Climbing School. Uh, 
Um, so those were some of the best days of my life and I cherish them. And, and the, uh, the ranger job for two seasons led to a national park service ranger position uh, in Rocky Mountain National Park. And again, back then I was a rock climber. I, I didn't have the eye. I had a passion for rock, but just a different passion than the passion I have now. Um, but it's still rock and stones. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's that's great. So it's great to know that you're a former ranger who is uh, giving a presentation now here. <laughs> well, thank you so much, Glenn. And thank you, everyone, for participating. Um, and we hope that you will join us for more of these virtual webinars or join us out on the land for uh, some upcoming programs that we have. December programs are out. So take a look at some of those. Thanks, Thanks everyone. everyone. And thank you, Glenn. You're welcome. Anytime.